Uh, good afternoon. This is Ted Ritzer with uh, the Greening Government uh, Series brought to you by Alberta Environment and Parks and the Municipal Climate Change Action Centre. Uh, today we're joined with uh, wonderful speakers speaking to us from Vancouver, BC, Colleen Hardwick, CEO of PlaySpeak. And uh, uh, I'll just read this a uh, bit of a blurb on the presentation because I think uh, Colleen really captured the essence of uh, what we're going to be exposed to. Uh, her topic is digital, geosocial, carbon-free citizen engagement. And uh, conducting public consultation online has the obvious benefits for being carbon-free. It's accessible 24-7, cost-efficient, does not require travel, room rentals, associated costs, saves on paper, and uh, just all around. Well, at the same time, which I really think is significant that uh, Colleen's company has, has done, is it protects individual citizen privacy while at the same time confirming uh, people's location and Colleen will speak to that uh, through the presentation. So uh, enough uh, of me and the main show, the main event begins with Colleen Hardwick. Thanks so much, Colleen. Thanks, Ted. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm excited at the prospect of being able to describe to you our work with PlaySpeak and the, the its purpose and the role that it fills in really advancing and legitimizing online public consultation uh, as the means to obtaining hard, reliable evidence to inform decision making and public policy development. We started developing PlaySpeak because we realized that there was a, a problem with public consultation, which is supposed to uh, form an important part of our democratic process. Uh, just as we vote, we are supposed to consult with people to obtain evidence about public opinion, uh, to inform our deliberation and ultimately influence those outcomes. But as we know, people have lost confidence in, uh, in that particular role within the democratic process. They think that there's no point consulting because all the decisions are foregone conclusions and it's only being conducted because there's a box somewhere that's got to be checked. So our, our objective with PlaySpeak is really focused on the evidence piece, um, making that evidence transparent and accountable to build confidence and legitimacy in the online process. Because um, when we look lar at the larger analytical framework in establishing legitimacy, we know that we need to be inclusive to bring in as many people as possible, the big tent, um, with inter internet penetration with wireless and mobile, we can access people 24 seven and there's a ubiquity on the internet that has really surpassed the initial problems around the digital divide. We need to provide people with effective control over decisions in their own areas and citizen engagement is a key element of that. We need to inform people and, and ensure that they have a firm grasp of the issues so they're not making knee jerk judgments but rather entering into a reasonable dialogue and civil discourse. The process has got to be transparent if we want to build trust and trust is obviously essential uh, in our democratic process. Anything uh, that we're doing through government really needs to have efficiencies, uh, both cost efficiencies and the ability to, uh, to uh, use these kinds of tools easily without any kind of, of specific training. You don't need to have a computer science degree to be able to operate in this environment. And finally, the, the unique thing about the internet, of course, is that it allows it to scale. We can reach virtually everyone on the planet now. But the key things that I'm gonna focus in on this discussion are that we need to authentically know that we're talking to real people and we need to know where they're coming from and uh, at the same time protect individual privacy and, and be sensitive to our privacy legislation. So let's take a look at how we do it now and where it falls down. Well, of course, historically we've conducted public meetings and anyone that looks at this slide uh, sort of laughs because they feel the pain of public meetings, open houses that seem to attract the usual suspects. They're not, uh, you know, they're not inclusive, they're not accessible, they're costly. Um, you know, renting a hall, the coffee and donuts, all of the display boards. Um, and again, you're getting a very small uh, cross-section of people that are going to participate. Um, 
and you know not even talking about all the flyers and, and newspapers and everything that you're using to uh, to bring it to people's attention in the first place. So public meetings are no longer really a successful strategy, although it'll take time for us to wean ourselves off of them. Um, we can't knock on people's doors anymore. People think it's a home invasion or they live in apartment buildings or condos and you can't get past the lobby. And we can't use landlines. Uh, frankly, uh, fewer and fewer people have landlines and the ones that have them have call displays and don't answer them. So our traditional methods are hampering our ability to read, reach a broad base of the public. But at the same time, online up until this point, point has been anonymous and not place-based. So particularly around anything controversial, we've seen the rise of the trolls. And those trolls might be uh, paid or unpaid, but uh, they are there to disrupt and enrage the process and, and discredit the process. So uh, we have a real problem with obtaining any kind of real, realistic information on the web as long as we have that anonymity. Um, similarly, we've seen people gaming the system. You'll get 1,500 responses to a survey, but when you look at the data, see that over 1,200 uh, responses are from the same IP address. Uh, we see this, they have names for this kind of behavior now where the objective is to skew the appearance of the result which again, you can do because there's no authentication in the process. And finally, we love social media for getting the word out. You know, it's, it's a great communications device, but it's, it's not great in terms of, of uh, getting verifiable evidence. Because as you know, we have large numbers of bogus accounts. Uh, Facebook is something in the order of 15% of all accounts and Twitter, forget about it. So if you're trying to do sentiment analysis based on social media evidence, you're not going to get what you need, which is hard, reliable evidence. So PlaySpeak has been uh, uh, developed since the beginning with the support of the National Research Council of Canada's IRAP program in recognition of the fact that we needed to come up with a system to authenticate people to place and prove it. So we are very squarely focused on, on providing digital identity authentication. We're a member of the Digital Identity Authentication Council of Canada in order to obtain that location-based data. But at the same time, we have to protect individual privacy. So PlaySpeak has su subscribed to privacy by design principles. There's seven principles that you must adhere to in the manner in which you architect or engineer your site. And in the case of PlaySpeak, what it boils down to is we disaggregate or separate out the private information of the individual from the feedback that they're providing. The proponent of the consultation knows that they're getting reliable place-based data, but they never have to touch the private information of the individual, such as their address, phone number, or email address. I, I joke that this is the separation of church and state, but it is an essential element in understanding the, uh, the steps necessary to building authenticated online consultation. So the model that we've been developing is a different one because you can't expect people to sign up and verify themselves every time they want to participate in a consultation. So the model that we've been using histor historically about setting up standalone websites or white labeling uh, application software is, is no, no longer an effective solution. So we've developed this geosocial model where once you've signed up and verified yourself, you can be notified of and participate in multiple consultations according to where you live and indeed now communicate with other people online within the boundaries of your own neighborhood. We go through both automated and opt-in checks to determine uh, your location. So uh, when you sign up, you can use your Facebook or Twitter to start your account, but then you need to enter in your address and it's going to check to make sure it's a real IP address, it's, it's in your area not in China or, or somewhere abroad. We use MaxMind to determine any kind of IP address fraud. Truly You is for uh, any kind of social media bad actors. And then you can choose to add additional layers of authentication such as your uh, cell phone or your mobile phone. And we use uh, something called Twilio to be checking those. And then your geolocation using the GPS device in, in whatever your phone or, or whatever device you're using. 
So once you sign up, you create a profile. Here's me. Here's where I live. And I can then choose to be notified of consultations in my area that are relevant to me by distance, keyword, and frequency. I choose my privacy settings. I can choose to be publicly anonymous, although my, my identity and the fact that I've been vetted will be known by the proponent. Um, and I can plug in my social media. And as I mentioned, we've recently a bit changed added the ability for people to communicate with one another within their neighborhoods. And this is designed for people to have ongoing in engagement with one another in between consultation topics that might have intervals between them. Again, the objective is to keep people more engaged in their communities. So your uh, notification settings are very important by distance, keyword, areas of interest and frequency because where we're going with this is we want to be able to be notified about all different kinds of consultations in our area that are relevant to us. So it's citizen-centered. We refer to this as the citizen-centered network effect. So it shouldn't matter whether it's, it's the city or the school board or the transit authority or whomever, they should be able to keep me informed based on where I live. And uh, you know, this is important because the ways that we've been doing it now are very ineffective. Putting up signs, ads in newspapers, uh, flyers in the mail, not only uh, have issues around uh, being carbon friendly or not, uh, but they just are not reaching people and people are constantly complaining that they weren't notified and they don't know anything about it and they weren't consulted. So we have been working again with the National Research Council support on an open data strategy which will automate the delivery of civic notifications. So let people know about proposed changes in their neighborhoods, uh, starting with land use change. We focused on rezonings and development permit applications initially. Uh, we, we did our first pilot starting with the city of, of Victoria here in British Columbia, but I believe that the city of Calgary is the first in Alberta that will be adopting our standardized schema for uh, creating land use change notifications. Neighborhoods I mentioned, again, this is all part of keeping people engaged in their communities on an ongoing basis so that they can see who else has been registered, uh, who, uh, what events might be happening in their neighborhoods and they can put things on their notice boards. Uh, this also speaks to work that was done by the Vancouver Foundation out here in 2012 around community and urban alienation and the fact that people complained they didn't know who lived on their block, let alone next door. So uh, it, this is all part of this larger move towards creating open communication. We started off uh, with land use change with rezonings and, and transportation engineering, but we've now see, seen PlaySpeak used by virtually every department in local government, now at the regional, provincial and federal level. Uh, similarly, we've seen it used by regulatory agencies, particularly transportation and telecommunications. In the private sector, it's been around uh, proposed land use change. So whether that's a, a property developer in an urban context or a resource developer like a mine that is seeking environmental approval that needs to show that they've consulted with, in, with people within the affected area. And then, as PlaySpeak is a social venture, we also make it available to nonprofits and community groups to strengthen uh, the quality of their lobbying data. So rather than sending off petitions to government, which go into a black hole, in this uh, authenticated and transparent uh, approach that PlaySpeak provides, they're able to genuinely show uh, that they have hard, reliable data to lobby government. But it's really the interplay, the cross-pollination between all of these different kinds of topics that gives rise to more and more, uh, more and more people getting involved, staying informed, providing feedback, engaged in the process, and ultimately influencing the outcomes. We've set it up, I should mention, as a software as a service model. We rejected advertising as a revenue model because obviously people don't like to have th be advertised or direct marketed to where they live. Uh, people don't want their data sold, which is what market research firms do. So we had to find some uh, revenue model to support it. So in this case, proponents of consultations that fall into the different categories that I described can pay on a a month, monthly or an annual basis uh, to use the platform and access the growing base of users and the, the various tools that we provide. So the way it works 
you set up your organization. Uh, an organization then has a dashboard where they can have multiple managers. Here's the example of the city of Fort St. John in Northern British Columbia, community of about 18,000. Uh, they have a series of different consultations. You can add new consultations, archive them once they're done. And then the consultations themselves or topics um, are very simple to lay out. You add your team, your contact details, basically go through this menu and fill in the blanks. Again, it's been designed to be uh, very user friendly and does not require any kind of, of technical skill. Uh, the key things to remember are you can determine who can participate. You can restrict it to a stakeholder, a stakeholder only uh, email list for focus groups, for example. You can restrict it to area residents only uh, for discussions or polls and surveys, or you can up it, open it up more broadly. Area residents being defined by the map, which will be our next slide. You can also determine how many levels of verification you require. So if it's a controversial topic and you really want to make sure you're only getting people within, say, a kilometer of, of the uh, subject area, you can add additional layers of authentication or you can make it you know, easier for people to participate. It's up to you. Uh, the map is really the core. This is, from a geographer's perspective, a voluntary geographic information system or a public participation G GIS. So uh, the first thing you have to figure out is what, what is the area that you want to, to uh, examine. So in this case, the city of New Westminster, a suburb of Vancouver, wanted to restrict participation exclusively to their residents. So they've geofenced their municipality. And then internally, each one of these colored polygons represents a neighborhood. So over here, whether they're doing surveys or discussions or polls, whatever tools they choose to use, they're going to be uh, exporting their data when they get down to their reports in a spatially segmented form. So we can understand how people's opinions differ by neighborhood. And again, you can, uh, scale this right down to the block level or go province-wide or depends on the scale of your consultation. So you can draw those polygons or you can upload a shape file or KML, any standard GIS boundary file. And on the public side, the public can see what's going on. Again, coming back to transparency as, as absolutely essential for building trust within the community. So the public can see how many people are, are viewing the material, how many are interacting. Uh, rule of thumb on the web is there's usually about a 10 to 1 ratio of lurkers to participants, people that will come in and uh, view the material versus actually contribute any kind of, of feedback. Uh, we're really happy when we see upward of 10%, 20, 25% uh, is really, uh, you know, you're doing well if you're able to get that level of traction. The public can see the discussions, they can see the poll results, there's all sorts of visualization um, that helps people understand as well as providing all the resources that support the, the, uh, the education or information around the consultation. Uh, if anyone's not familiar with it, you should be. The International Association for Public Participation has a spectrum of public impact that we have used as a guide or, or matrix for developing the features within PlaySpeak. So it starts with inform, getting the word out to people, notifying and educating them about the topic, consulting, receiving feedback in a variety of forms, again, which is going to be spatially segmented in, in the case of PlaySpeak. Um, involve, involve people in bi-directional communication and dialogue around the consultation. Collaborate is the many-to-many. -many. This is bringing in open innovation and the crowd and um, going out to the, to the crowd to get uh, broad input. And then ultimately empower is putting the final decision making in the hands of the public. And uh, I should mention that our 2014 National Research Council project was place vote where we built a prototype for location-based, encrypted, fully secure online voting. So just going over the features very briefly, uh, we notify people that are in the area that have already verified uh, their location. There's a short Twitter-friendly abstract. Overviews are done in, in WYSIWYG editors, which means what you see is what you get. Very, um, very robust and customizable word processing editors. You've got 
um, offline real life interaction for contacts and, and events because you still are going to have public meetings. You know, we it's going to take time to go through a, a shift over to fully online keywords and social media for online interaction and resources. You can upload upload any kind of photos, videos, links, documents, anything that supports your consultation. Then on consult, we've got polls with instant results. We've got surveys. We have two survey platforms built in currently, Lime Survey and Fluid Survey, uh, with more coming soon. In each case, of course, though, the survey results are spatially segmented. Place it is, is a, a play on post it, being able to put your, your, your notes on a map. Notice board for user-generated content, again, video, um, images, or text. Discussion is actually more involved because you've got bi-directional communication and multi-threaded discussions going on, again, that indicate the location of the respondents. I should point out again that people can choose to be anonymous in these discussions, um, but we have found, even in controversial topics, that fewer than 5% of respondents choose to be uh, anonymous. And then uh, as we continue to develop PlaySpeak, we're adding more and different features, either developing them ourselves or plugging them in through APIs, which are application programming interfaces. The idea being that the more people are informed, the more opportunities they have to engage, the more active they will become in our democracy, which is our core mission. Uh, we've taken an open systems approach, so we've developed buttons and widgets and iframes that you can customize and plug into different websites. And we've developed our own API. This is the one thing that does require some technical expertise. If third-party websites or applications want to use PlaySpeak to location verify their users, that is also available. Uh, here's an example with the City of Fort St. John that I mentioned earlier, how they've iframed PlaySpeak right into their website. So there's the map of Fort St. John. They've got, I think, eight different topics going on in, uh, currently, and they're building their base of green dots, which are, are their verified users. Again, a key concept. You want to be able to build your base of engaged uh, citizens uh, so that you don't have to go and recruit from scratch every time there's a new, uh, new consultation. So we've, uh, we've become quite uh, good at, at strategies around promotion and recruiting new participants. And we've got lots of, of uh, assistance that we can provide people in this regard. And then when we get to our reports, we're able to ob obtain those reports in Excel spreadsheets and in PDF documents, depending on whether it's polls or surveys or discussions, whatever tools we choose to use. Um, you can plug in your Google Analytics so that you can get more traditional web analytics like time on site and bounce rate. And this is a nod to the fact that, that people can see the high level metrics. They can see how many people are engaging uh, because that speaks to our, our focus on transparency. And then we've developed tools like this activity map so that uh, you as a proponent can drill in, depending on what your, your map and your geography is again, and see how you're doing in different areas. So if there's areas that are underrepresented, you can focus your promotional act activities on those areas in order to get the, the most representative uh, responses from your constituents. It's important to be engaged with people on an ongoing basis. I'm not talking about spamming them, but you do need to continuously let people know what's going on. You know, maybe it's every couple of weeks you go back with a new poll question or some responses to a survey or an invitation to an open house. But uh, you don't just talk to people and, and go away. You need to be engaged. Engagement is an ongoing activity. And again, this comes back to our feedback loop. If people can see that they, uh, in an open way, that they can be involved, uh, it's inclusive, it's transparent, it's defensible, and that strengthens government's relationship with its, its constituents, with its residents. At the end of the day, we believe that information and communication technology has the ability to transform government, uh, to transform the relationship between citizens and uh, their elected officials and the civil servants uh, that that uh, are supporting them through a wide variety of different kinds of activities. And uh, this is just uh, at the end of my presentation to let you know that uh, our innovation that we've developed out here on the west coast of, of Canada is now spreading across the country into the United States, into Western Europe, 
and into Australia. So we're we're very pleased that that the emphasis on open, transparent, and defensible uh, consultation online is really helping to ad advance um, our relationships in Western democracies. So Ted, that's it for me. Uh, where are we? I've, I've taken about 25 minutes. So uh, I think it's a good time to break for questions. Absolutely. Uh, so I would ask uh, Wendy and Mark, uh, have you, uh, have you been uh, watching those questions? And certainly uh, turn on your video and turn on your mics there uh, and uh, reconnect with the folks. And uh, if I could ask you to pose some of those questions that you've been monitoring online. Uh, hi, it's Wendy here. We have Heidi uh, joining us from Pincher Creek and she just noted that, wow, this is fantastic. Well, thank you. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Is Heidi not hey, Heidi? You're a panelist, aren't you? Can you not? Um, uh, no, she, no, not at this time. She's, oh, a, she's a webinar person. Webinar participant. Hmm. Uh, are there any other questions that people have posed? No, there's nothing else posted. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I would. Uh, I mean, I can kind of uh, review some things in terms of highlights, which which I took note during your your presentation, Colleen. First oh. and foremost. No, go ahead, Wendy. Oh, just sorry. I got to deal with Heidi. She said she sent a post to the Q button. Okay. So, so uh, kind of reviewing some of the notes that I made, Colleen, which I think is like, uh, first and foremost, I think you provide government with a way of kind of using uh, the internet in a way that, that neutralizes, you had mentioned the trolls and gaming, and I think uh, governments at all levels really are apprehensive about kind of opening up and, and using, uh, you know, those kind of using the internet for public feedback. So um, the other thing that I really love about what you've done is the, the privacy by design to separate and to make it, uh, to be very respectful of people's privacy, that you uh, take care of the whole sort of the troll and the, and the anonymity, but at the same time, uh, register people by location. So for, for people in government, it's all about, uh, you know, citizens and, and where they live, work, and play. And I think that's what we have to get at as far as being able to create a very easy way for citizens to provide us with uh, feedback and input, but at the same time, by default, designed so that we know where they're coming from. So uh, uh, pretty much all governments on the planet are are very sort of GIS oriented. And that was the other thing that I noticed like uh, and noted was this whole kind of uh, your mention of, you know, the map is, is at the core. And uh, I think you used the phrase public participation GIS. Well, governments at all level are using GIS to, to be able to plan uh, service provision and and improve service provision. So I thought that was kind of strategic as, as well. And the other thing that I took note that I thought was uh, really strategic was uh, the GEO um, ID API, which third party, so, uh, you know, in creating opportunities for um, the private sector, uh, you know, anywhere in the planet kind of to be able to kind of take advantage of the privacy by design and the geo coded uh, public input, uh, I think that's strategic to governments as well. So uh, that was quite a long summary, I suppose. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, it's all about making it real. The problem, as I view it, is up until now, the internet has been uh, really a toy. We do, we use social media, we set up Facebook pages, and we do lots of, you know, tweeting, but it's not real it's not authenticated and it's not reliable as a source of evidence. And that's a huge problem. And I, I, that, that's part of the problem. The other problem is that we silo things. We say, uh, you know, the city is doing this or this department is doing this and there's no cross pollination between them. And it just doesn't work that way on the web anymore. This is why I focus on the whole notion of citizen centric because it's got to come to me and it's got to come to me because of where I live. And in order for that to happen, it has to be made real. We have to connect digital identity to place and prove it. And until we do that, 
we won't be able to rely on the feedback data that we're obtaining, um, let alone make it actionable. Mm -hmm. But that's scary. I mean, that's, that is nothing less than a, a paradigm shift, right? Um, because what happens if, you know, you're a civil, service, civil servant, you're obliged to conduct a consultation, you put it online and, and you're afraid it's going to get hijacked. Um, you know, we see all the time that uh, people do the sort of the virtual equivalent of busing in their supporters to try and dominate a situation or, or, or the appearance of, of having a majority. And it's not true, but we don't have the tools to, to know that it, whether it's true, true or not. And so that's very disarming uh, for, for people, uh, civil servants that are, are obliged to be uh, monitoring and managing this process. So again, I believe that making it real does help ameliorate that situation because you know that you're reaching real people. Uh, we saw this played out recently with the municipal, or sorry, the, uh, uh, the Metro Vancouver uh, transportation referendum that was conducted in the spring. We did a, a pilot project with News 1130, one of the, uh, the news radio stations uh, across the country. And, and what we, we were interested to know what people's opinions were, and we were able to segment them by municipality. There's 22 municipalities within Metro Vancouver. So we could detect and understand how people's opinions differed in different parts of the region. Um, I should mention that our results came within 0.03% of the actual result of, uh, of the referendum. But that, which I attribute to wisdom of crowds generally. But what was an important takeaway was that of the almost a thousand comments in the discussion forums, we had zero trolls. Hmm. The quality of, of the discourse, coming back to that reasonableness uh, comment in, in my presentation was, it was it was reasonable discourse. We didn't have people calling each name each other names. There was people were thoughtful and intelligent in their discussions. And I, I think I mentioned earlier that we found that fewer than five percent of the respondents chose to be anonymous, which mm -hmm. I again attribute to the fact that people have been self-identifying. They want to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So I take heart. I mean, we just seen we've just seen a federal election with almost seventy percent turnout, the highest in twenty five years. I think the met the people are really starting to get the word out there that we want to have more openness. We want to have more transparency, as 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 the Canadian population. We want to be able to have those kinds of open and authentic dialogues with our our elected representatives and our our public servants. So, I say so, all that, but we need to make it real. It, it, it's just not going to fly with Facebook or, or you know, other kinds of, of white label solution like SurveyMonkey surveys, for example. Yeah. So, so, Colleen, there's a couple of other uh, questions there. Courtney Scott had uh, asked, besides the city of Calgary, are there any other locations in Alberta that are using uh, PlaySpeak? And if so, which ones? And uh, are there any learnings derived from using the program? Well, there's lots um, in, in terms of the, the um, learnings. And, and um, I would encourage you to look at the case studies. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you go down to the bottom of the site and click on About and then go to Studies, you'll see that we, we have uh, created case studies um, over a whole bunch of different kinds of, of consultations. Mm -hmm. uh, again, as I mentioned before, we've seen it used in a, a lot of different, a uh, lot of different kinds of applications. Um, so, in these are ones that have been done historically in Calgary, cycling, skate parks. Mm -hmm. We just finished the election. We we did a topic for again with another of the news radio stations. Uh, parks, recycling, LRT, and Curry Barracks. This was a Canada land, so the federal government. So um, these were specifically ones. I know that there's um, things going on right now, like um, in Canmore, for example. Hold on. I should have had this queued up before, but let me just grab it now. Uh, the Smith Creek area plan mm -hmm. is um, one that is currently running. Mm -hmm. And um, this is 
uh, if you also go to the the website, which I'll just go to quickly, and you go to the feedback section, you will see that there is um, a, a, a little iframe widget of PlaySpeak right within that. So mm -hmm. we're hoping that we're going to be seeing more and more um, in Alberta and across the country. Um, again, this is st still fairly early stage. That's why we've been doing so much research and development with the National Research Council. But uh, if you would like to, to play with it, all you have to do is go to start a consultation and you can walk through and set up your own topics and you can take it all the way up to the point of publishing it because you can't make it pu public. We do, we do have uh, nominal charges like $250 a month for uh, doing yeah. yourself topics, for example. Which, which, uh, which brings us to our next question, Colleen. There was a, a question posed specifically about costs and, and uh, people were wondering, well, is this just a tool for the big urban cities or is it accessible to small rural uh, uh, cities or like you mentioned, uh, not even not-for-profits or community groups based on cost? Sure. Um, the pricing is, I'll go back to that. If, um, it's, we're seeing it uh, used again by lots of different applications, but it's not expensive. This, we have to charge something for it because I got to pay my staff. Uh, but um, so it's for the do it yourself version. If you just go to the website and you go to start a consultation, you set it up yourself and manage it yourself. It's $250 a month or 2,500 a year, uh, which is two months free. And um, if you want uh, more features, more frequent customer support, it's 500 a month or 5,000 a year. Um, and enterprises where we're seeing it used across municipalities like that Fort St. John example. Mm -hmm. And in that case, we negotiate an um, unlimited number of topics based on your population size. And it's a bit of a negotiation. And then we, you know, we embed it into your website, sort of like I showed you with that Fort St. John example. Mm -hmm. um, if there are nonprofits um, and uh, that want to to use the platform for their consultations, they can get in touch with us. We have done sponsorships of different organizations um, to help them get them up and running uh, to be able to be strengthening the quality of their consultations as well. Well, I guess uh, another question that's uh, uh, come in is uh, the integration with uh, municipal or government uh, GIS systems. Could you speak to that, Colleen? Well, I'd need more information than, than that. This, uh, this platform is using uh, Google Maps as its base, okay. if uh, that may be part of the question. We've been doing a lot of other interesting GIS stuff. Uh, for example, um, if there's GIS people on the line, they may be familiar with CardoDB who mm -hmm. do a lot of um, visualization. So they, I'll, I'll just show you a couple examples. This is how they've taken our uh, database and done a visualization time lapse to show the growth of, of uh, the PlaySpeak user database. And uh, this is the Vancouver version. But you can see whenever there was a consultation dropped into an area that you get a proliferation of, of uh, new signups. I'll give you a couple of other interesting examples. Uh, this is one where we're looking at the growth of PlaySpeak internationally, uh, which is really heartening to me to, to see it starting to get used around the world. Um, and most recently, one more just uh, because of the timing on this, we looked, here's another Vancouver-based one, but we looked at the federal election and how people said that they were going to vote um, down here, uh, color coded, obviously, according to the parties. Uh, fascinating exercise. Uh, and and um, I've yet to go back in and, and uh, look at how the outcomes, uh, because we had broken this down by riding, but uh, I'm, I'm reasonably sure that we're looking at some pretty accurate results. But anyhow, I, 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 I just show you this because this shows you how we're integrating with another GIS system, namely CardoDB. No, that's excellent, Colleen. Another uh, question that's come in 
is related to examples of how a school has used PlaySpeak, or or have you got an an education example? I sure do. Uh, um, excellent. Surrey Schools um, has is now going out on its third consultation in a row, um, but this was an example of one that the the last one that they did, and in this case they broke down. Uh, their district by high school catchment area mm -hmm. so that as they're looking at all of their results uh, again uh, whether it's discussions or surveys or whatever they were doing they could understand how uh, people's opinions differed by uh, school catchment area so um, in this topic page you can see they had a they had a quick little poll here um, whether they had kids in their program of choice. We can see the, the metrics of how many people were viewing. They got about a 20% um, uptake on this, uh, which was we were pleased with at the time. Um, and it, 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 they doubled up their user base over the last one. And we expect that, that they will add capacity in the next one as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they plugged in their Twitter and their Facebook, as you can see. That this is the, the overview page where they put in the description of of uh, the, what the consultation is all about. Their resources here, they have all of their, you know, different uh, visual supporting information about the consultation. Um, and uh, then they've uploaded a bunch, they've got links and uh, documents for download that relate to a bunch of different uh, things in their program. And then in their discussions, again, we could see uh, they pre-moderated this. They do, you do have the, the choice to pre-moderate should you decide to do so, and they wanted to do that in, in the case of, of this one. So um, in terms of the discussions, we can see, um, we can see where people are coming from. Um, that we can see their name, and we can see uh, where they're coming from. In this case, it's the, the high school catchment areas, as, as I mentioned. Um, People can choose to be anonymous, but I, I would be hard pressed, I think, going through this example to try and find someone that had had chosen to be uh, anonymous because we just uh, we just don't see it. But as you can see, it's it's a very active um, discussion. I was pleased on uh, with the Surrey schools because it was actually the school superintendent Jordan Tinney who was doing a lot of answering uh, to the discussions or engaging in the discussions with the parents directly. And uh, that goes a long way in building uh, legitimacy in the process when you've got real, uh, real people in authority interacting with the public. So, so did students take part as well in that, Colleen? No, this was for parents. Oh, okay. Yeah, this was really parents talking about their children's educational programs. Mm -hmm. So, so not they did it with students. Actually, I think that would be fantastic. Uh, they should have it as part of the, the civics curriculum. Oh, absolutely! That would be wonderful as part of kind of a digital citizenship. Absolutely. Well, another question that's kind of come in is related to examples of uh, uh, regulated uh, agencies. Whether uh, have you got any examples of those or? Well, I would think um, that TransLink would be an ex uh, example of that. Um, TransLink did their base plan consultation using PlaySpeak. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, the Patello Bridge consultation. Um, again, I point you to the various different case studies that uh, oh, right on. there's a lot of them here. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are examples. School. Well, it looks like that one, Sustainable Orange County, that looks pretty relevant to, uh, to the uh, Municipal Climate Change Action Center folks, our partner. Well, this was uh, Orange County, Florida, and mm -hmm. this was one of our early, uh, so you can see this was back in uh, 2013, 20, 2014. So a fairly early consultation for, for us, mm -hmm. but there was some terrific uh, some terrific uh, information that they developed as part of that consultation. Um, so anything that anybody sees uh, on the site um, and you have any more information that you're looking for, don't hesitate to be in touch. Some of these consultations um, have been archived, meaning that they're, they're no longer um, 
uh, they're no longer visible. But if you go to the Explore Consultation Topics page and tick the box here, so mm -hmm. Sustainable, um, you can see ones like that Orange County one. Uh, okay, so there's more. There's the Dunk. Oh, we're going on. Yeah. Island. Yeah, there's, there's more than that. There's other ones that have been done that, that have sustainability that you can refer to. Yeah, well, another question that's come in is, do any provincial governments use PlaySpeak, or federal for that matter? Well, I mentioned uh, Canada Lands has used it in the Curry Barracks consultation in terms of the feds, and mm -hmm. we're talking to them out here as well about uh, the Jericho development on the west side of, of Vancouver. But one that um, is should be quite interesting, um, and we're going to be oops, we're going to be seeing a bunch of new stuff coming out on is up in the Yukon, hmm. and uh, the the Yukon Highways and Public Works has has used this in in conjunction with CH2M Hill, which is the uh, consulting engineering on, firm on the, mm -hmm. on the project. And again, um, they've done some really interesting things here, and there uh, I I know that. I've just heard that there's another round and reports that are going to be coming out, but um, they've got all they've done actually fly through uh, 3D fly throughs uh, segments that you can go and look at here. Mm -hmm. uh, they've done it in both French and English because um, they, they felt obliged to do that. Uh, we did some really interesting uh, geo web work here. It, there's 10 segments, as you can see, of the of the highway. And you can drill in to each one and uh, see the engineering drawings. So uh, it's it's nice and interactive for for people. Um, if we again, if we want engagement with people, uh, the number one way to to get them engaged is showing them video. Yeah. Here's an example of the uh, the video. I'll just turn off. This. Can, you, can you still hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay, good, because I just wanted to mute the, the sound on the video, not, not all overall. But as you're going to see in just a second, this is then going to take us in um, to there, go, there we're going now in the 3D fly through. Mm -hmm. So not only can we drill down into the individual engineering drawings for each segment of this proposed project, but we can also get in and, and do those 3D fly throughs, which is oh, that's super excellent. Super cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is an example of uh, uh, another uh, provincial oriented one would be um, in British Columbia here, we're working with uh, BC Housing, and I'll just find the uh, Riverview project. This is the Riverview um, Mental Hospital out in Coquitlam. Uh, is a, a large property where the, the provincial government is looking at, at the vision around what they want to do uh, with the lands in the future. So uh, they've been using PlaySpeak for, uh, you know, both getting the information out, letting people know they'll go back in and notify people about new open houses, for example, keeping them photo, uh, informed. They've got videos from all the different open houses that they've done. Um, and they are promoting, you know, they've been promoting their events. You can put up your event calendars here as well. And then there have been discussions going on um, around the, um, you know, you know, getting feedback from people uh, around things like the open houses themselves. Oops. And uh, so on. So yeah, those was, those are a couple example of, of um, uh, provincial uses of the platform. No, this is excellent, Colleen. I don't see any uh, any more uh, questions coming oh. through the, the chat window. Uh, it's Wendy? Wendy here, yeah. There's one from Laura Johnson, and um, she wanted to know a little bit more about the confidentiality of the system. Um, not so much about that, but rather the information that's generated, the analysis and findings. So how do you keep the analysis and findings confidential? Um, okay, well, that's separate. I was going to talk about privacy by design, but I've, I've talked a little bit about how we separate the private information. Um, uh, when you go into a topic, I'm just going to go into uh, the back end here. Um, this is where you, you um, choose 
you know, who's going to be part, you know, everything, who's on my team, my contact details, all of that stuff. When you get down to reports, um, you're able, you export those reports because it's raw data. And then you're going to fashion that into whatever report format that you're going to be contributing. So, um, you will have sorted through whether, again, your surveys and, and taking the discussion comments, for example, exporting them and putting them in, in your own reporting. Um, what will be, if, if you choose under your features um, to use, for example, polls, you're going to see the instant results of those polls, just like you would in, in any, anything. In uh, discussions, you're going to be able to see, you can, as I mentioned, you can pre-moderate if you want to, but if you d don't, then you're, you're gonna see the responses that people put up there on an ongoing basis. Um, but all of the report findings accrue to the proponent. These, um, PlaySpeak is, is enabling technology. The results of, of your surveys and so on um, are yours as a proponent. Uh, again, the only thing that, that is kept separate is the private information of the individuals um, as I described with privacy by design. The most that you, you'll be able to, to, to see though, um, and I'm just loading this, is you can see the name and a, a corresponding polygon location in the back end of your participants. Uh, because the logic here is that even if someone was standing up in a public meeting, they would have to at least state their name and where they were from. Um, okay. So we do have that available um, on a topic by topic basis. Mm -hmm. Well, another question that was posed related to this webinar, which I can answer. Uh, the question was related about finding out about our audience today and uh, PlaySpeak, like uh, the Zoom system that we're using for this webinar is cloud-based. And this webinar is being, not only is it being recorded, but it automatically records everybody who is registered and how long they've participated in the webinar, and it's uh, created into a, an Excel spreadsheet. So everybody that's participated in this webinar, we've already got a record of that on file associated with this specific webinar. So that kind of brings us up to this. You can run, but you can't hide on the internet. <laughs> well, um, being authentic is a good thing. Yeah. And it's essential for building trust and uh, building trust in our democracy, I see, is mission critical at, at this stage of our development. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the last opportunity for any more questions, uh, Mark or Wendy, have you noted any more? Uh, no, those are all the questions that I found in the Q&A window and in the chat window. And the uh, last opportunity to the panelists to pose some questions before we close this webinar. Well, thanks so much, Colleen. This has been fascinating. The, I have to say that I'm surprised at the level of sophistication and the integration that you've done and the, the spectrum of uh, customers. So it's uh, been fascinating. Well, thank you very much. And just know that we've got um, lots of other things that we're working on in our roadmap. And the ultimate objective, what I'm trying to do here from an individual standpoint, and I hope everybody that, that is on this uh, webinar that that if they haven't done so already, please register. Please sign up. We need we need more green dots there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what we want to do is have your profile becomes your your uh, dashboard for real life where you live. My vision for this is that I should be kept informed about things that are going on in my neighborhood that are relevant to me and I should be able to provide verifiable, defensible feedback data based on where I live. So it doesn't matter whether it's a rezoning application or a bike lane or a road closure, each and every case, whoever is making that decision should be informed by the location of the respondents and know that that information is reliable and legitimate. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us, uh, Colleen. Uh, it's been fascinating. And again, uh, thanks everybody for participating uh, and uh, tuning into this w webinar. Uh, there will be another webinar again next 